Okay, to do that, I'm going to focus on pinyon and juniper in this really brief summary of climate and vegetation history of the Great Basin. There's two major climate periods I'm going to be focusing on. The first they call the Pleistocene. For our purposes, that's from about 11,000 years ago back. How far back doesn't matter because we're not going back that far. Last glacial maximum about 18,000 years ago. The other period is they call the Holocene. That's from about 9,000 years to the present. Now in the Pleistocene, climate was very variable. It just varied around an average. It was much cooler and wetter than what we have now. The Holocene, again, has been very variable. Sound familiar about the Great Basin? But this variation was around an average that was much warmer and drier. The period from 11,000 to 9,000 was a very bumpy transition from one average to the other. Now, I'm going to bring in, I have two sites, and I'm going to go through a long explanation of what they are. But we have detailed vegetation history for the Holocene. One of those sites, that history actually goes back 30,000 years. So we go back to four last glacial maximum. Now, this, if that, that site that goes back the longest, juniper is continuously present through the whole record. It's probably there for a lot longer than that, just 30,000 years is all the further back our record goes. Back in the Pleistocene, some of the cooler, wetter periods, that juniper is growing with white bark pine. In today's vegetation, it's Wyoming sagebrush, Mahant sagebrush, and shedscape. Now the difference there is, when it's with white bark pine, is at the lower, that site is, represents the lower edge of the subalpine. Today, it represents the lower edge of the sagebrush zone. That same tree is there clear through. It's the only species we have that manages to do that. Right, right away, should say something about there's something special about juniper plugging here. Well, what is going on is running from the mountains of Southern California up the Sierras into the Southern Cascades is Western juniper. This is a tree that's adapted to much cooler, wetter conditions. Over the last two million years, the prevailing westerly winds, the winds out of the west blowing east, have been carrying that western juniper pollen out into the Great Basin. And it has been fertilizing Utah juniper. Those seeds that have that hybridization in them are capable of surviving cooler, wetter conditions. And this didn't happen all at once, it's been kind of, it's, pollen comes into the western Great Basin, some seeds are there, these grow trees, that pollen moves further away east, meanwhile pollen keeps coming from the west. So it's been kind of a stair-step pattern across the Great Basin, it's probably been going on at least two million years. Starting ten years ago, we've been studying the genetics of this tree, and we can track western juniper genes all the way into western Utah. Probably took most of that time to get there. You only find them on higher elevation, cooler sites. Like Lester Day's field trip, the final site we ended up at was over 8,000 feet on the west side of the needle range. And the trees there showed western genetics. I'm not going to try to explain it. Anybody who wants to know what that is, I'll talk about later. I'm not going to try to explain it now. So that's one of our trees. A tree that is really a genetic mix across the Great Basin it can literally shift its genetic basis to adapt to climate as it changes. Well, very amazing ability with that stuff. Okay, now for pinion. 12,000 years ago, towards the end of the Pleistocene, the vegetation on the valley floor where Las Vegas is now was sagebrush, pinion, and juniper. Not creosote bush. Prior to 12,000 years ago, or up about that time, there was no pinion in the Great Basin north of where is now Mojave Desert. As we transition out of the Pleistocene into the Holocene, by 9,000 years ago, pinion was moving north. By 5,000 years ago, it had reached City of Rocks in Idaho. It's a different kind of adaptation, but also one that shows why it's able to do what it does. Now, going from 
Las Vegas to Idaho in 5,000 years. Seems like a lot of time until you think about it. That represents a movement north of an average of about a football field a year. For a plant species, that is a really rapid rate of movement. But Kenyon did it. That explains why some of the changes we've got going on are now happening. So in some ways, if you take the broader ecological view, Kenyon is an invasive species in the Great Basin. Most of the rest of what we find here, the sagebrush, the salt desert shrub species, the juniper, we can find them here as far back as we can manage to find the records. They've been growing together for a long time. Kenyon is the one that comes in when it's warm and disappears when it gets cold. We're in a warm phase, so then it comes. So that's the mix we're dealing with. Now I'll go to the handout, which I hope is out there. We have been doing aging entire stands of trees on mountains around the Great Basin we have and other people have to see what the pattern of this established increase we've seen has been. Now these are what are called bar charts. Each bar represents 10 years. The height of the bar is the number of trees that established during that decade. Now the top chart here is the first study we did. I want to look at this middle section, which includes the stands that have trees of all ages. Now we go back here, my glasses so I can read it. That's 1,600, and we have some of the sites we actually have. And the cutoff on this for the upper one and the middle one, if a site had a tree that established prior to 1860, it would be considered an existing woodland. If the site, the oldest tree on the site established after 1860, it would be considered an expansion woodlands. In every case, if there was a tree there that established prior to 1860, there were trees there that established back for two, three, four hundred years earlier. From for two to three hundred years prior to the late 1800s, the average rate on everywhere we have the data is roughly a tree per acre per decade for several hundred years. At the end of the 19th century, end of the 20th century, boom. You can see how those bars just go up. This included the woodlands expanding out into areas where they weren't before, the top set of graphs, as well as woodlands with trees had been present for several hundred years. Whether it was new area or existing area, a great influx in density. The existing areas saw their densities go up two to three times. Densities out in the expansion areas equal that amount. Now what is interesting on this is that this Data this peak, this peaks in the middle of the 20th century, and then you'll notice as we go towards the end, the bars get short. So we had a, a peak established, but now the rate at which trees are establishing out in the new areas, the rate at which they're establishing in the existing areas, is much diminished from what it was in the middle of the 20th century. So coming out of the little ice age in the middle of the 18th century, there was some kind of a climate shift that facilitated the rapid expansion and establishment of these two trees. As we've come out of the 20th century, whatever climate that was, we're still trying to figure it out, is shutting that back down. Now the second bar is a forest site, and here I've separated tree-dominated sites from understory-dominated sites. The peak and the drop is the same. So it's not the level of tree dominance that's causing the shut off, it's something else. It's got to be climate related. In this under down canyon site, I have plots that are in the high tree dominance category that are only 100 meters away from plots that are in the low tree dominance category. Over the 20th century, the pattern of establishment and the rate of establishment by decade in the low and the higher are significantly correlated on the low tree dominance plot was consistently half or less than what it was on the high tree dominance. So they're only 100 meters apart. So there's a site-specific control on the level or the rate on the amount, but not on the pattern for that 20th century peak and drop. 
Now there's been some additional data done, a master's student at the University of Nevada at the top of the next page did a study similar down on two mountaintops in southern Nevada, which are just to the west of here. It's part of some other stuff, data that the Franco Biondi, the dendrochronologist there was doing. The Megan Bradley aged these trees. One of those sites, Mount Irish, is a mountain that's sitting in the Mojave Desert. It is surrounded by creosote. The woodlands are perched on top like a cap. This is a very steep, rugged mountain. There's actually places they're almost climbing cliffs to get to it. This has never been grazed. It's never been logged. It's never had any of the disturbances of the other sites. Same pattern. That's why we think there's something climbing going on. And the bottom figure is from my PhD, the site where I gather the data for my PhD dissertation, which is just to the west of here, just across the mountain from where we went on the field trip yesterday. Again, the same pattern peak in the 20th century and then a drop. Now, so that, and when we were out on the site this morning, nearly all the trees that were coming down and going through the chipper are from that 20th century peak. We have multiple sites now across the basin where the, the woodlands, today's woodlands, for most of them, they are dominated by trees that established in 1920 the majority of the biomass is the trees that established during that period. So basically we spent the last century establishing those trees. We're going to spend the first half of this century dealing with the consequences of those trees growing up. And all the suppression of the understory, the increase in fuel loads, the insect bulbs, everything this whole meeting is about. That's kind of a, a quick history of how we got up to here. And then and then I have a couple of illustrations. I recently was able to get a study funded that went back and resampled the chainings I did for my masters. And the top pair of pictures, the first picture, I was taking a picture of the chaining, the back mountain in the background just kind of came along for the ride. Look at the difference between 1971 and 2008. Now on that mountain in the background, the trees were already there. Most of them are just too small to show up. By 2008, they're taking over that mountain. Also, the rate of recovery of the chain. The chaining left half the density behind, the little trees. Those little trees, without the competition of the big trees and the temporary reduction in sagebrush and such from the chaining, I was getting up to 18-inch leader growth and quarter-inch growth rates. Rapid acceleration of growth. We have this one site that was chained 50 years ago. That site is fully tree dominated. That's what he just said, a phase three woodland. Again, about half the trees survive. There's a huge potential in these trees if the opportunity is there for them to move in and take over. But then some of the consequences of this rapid expansion across the Great Basin through the 20th century is now, I estimate, roughly 200,000 acres a year are now moving into phase three into these high tree dominated situations with their high fuel loads. And that's the bottom picture. That's a typical woodland. In 1860, that was sagebrush. In 2006, the fire went through that under extreme fire conditions. That fire burned. 6,000 acres in less than eight hours. And it's almost a total burn. You, you can't you have, really have trouble finding a place where you got enough pockets left behind. Very hot, very intense. There were many pockets of old growth woodland in there that were places that had previously been fire safe. Under the intensity of this fire, it just went right through. In fact, there's one place, there's an old growth that's separated by almost 70 yards from the next woodland some low sagebrush, and it's down the slope from there, there's expansive woodland. That fire came up the hill, it jumped that gap, hit the top of the trees in the old growth, and then dropped on down through and went on through. The first row of trees, the bottom half of the tree still has their needles. Once you get behind that first row and from then on, they're burned right down the ground. You can see how it jumped. So all this 
a lot of major problems here, and everything we're trying to deal with in this meeting is really important. We're breaking up these fuel loads, we're rebuilding these communities, we're restoring our functionality, and getting our habitat and watersheds back. And that's sort of my 15-minute quick review of <laughs> climate and vegetation history.